Good morning. I'm glad to be with you this morning. I'm Sean, and this is most of everybody I've seen. Uh, the rest of it is with my ten year old daughter, and her shoes. So um, it's a uh, probably going to work two years really well for everybody here with us. Would you stand with us to begin this morning? Thousands. Oh, my hope is found. 
Good morning again. <clears throat> you might remember me from a couple minutes ago during the worship. Well, it is a privilege to be with you this morning. I, I appreciate very much the invitation your pastor extended to me and, and board perhaps. I don't know if he just makes unilateral decisions like that. But nevertheless, I appreciate um, the invitation. I also appreciate a pause between music and preaching so that I can rehydrate because there's a lot there's a lot to that. As your pastor knows, doesn't he lead worship for you? Amen. And then preaches? Amen. Yeah. I should get one of those backpacks where you just bring the bring the straw around. <clears throat> I have been a regular church attender for 33 years. And the reason that I share that with you is, I mean, when I was two weeks old and dance, <laughs> attending church, that really wasn't my call, right? And I couldn't drive myself to church at two weeks old. But nevertheless, I have been a regular attender for 33 years. And I share that with you because I want you to appreciate that I have lived up close and personal with Christian people for a long time. And whether as a child, a teen, or an adult, I have lived in close proximity. I went to a Christian school through eighth grade. I've been around a lot of Christian people. And over the years, I have noticed something about some of these Christian people, not all of these Christian people, some of these Christian people that really bothers me. Um, and what really bothers me about what I see is a lot of these Christian people feel really, really badly about themselves. Now, I'm not referring to times of conviction when the Holy Spirit has something to deal with in your life. It's not what I'm talking about. There is a, there is a holiness about that conviction, and you might not feel great in that moment, okay? That's not what I'm talking about. I'm also not talking about those moments when that same conviction simply calls you higher to another level, like moving from the fourth grade to the fifth grade. Some of us feel bad when we get to the fifth grade and think, I should have already known all of these things that they're teaching me in the fifth grade. We think that spiritually. Why? I don't know. Maybe we're perfectionists in that respect. But that's also not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about growth. I'm not talking about improvement. I'm not talking about that. What I'm talking about is this sense, this pervasive, this deep, in, <coughs> at the depth of your soul, this, at the most base level, you feel shame. You feel humiliation. And it's, again, it's, it's not about something in particular. If it was, that would be helpful because we could just address or deal with that thing and then we could move forward. But I'm talking about over the years, I have seen Christians who feel shameful. I'm not referring to people who have a particularly sketchy past, right? but they just feel one down. They kind of feel less than everybody else that they're around. Now, if you're really quick with the deductive reasoning, you're probably thinking, is that also maybe your story a little bit, Sean? And it is. It was. The Lord is helping me with it, and I am learning some things. I'm growing. But this has been my story. Now, I'm not talking about the self-esteem type movement kind of thing. So if that's what you're hearing, please hang with me again. I want us to be in a posture that we're, we'll hear what the Spirit has to say. And I'm not talking about self-esteem. I'm not talking about self-help. I'm not talking about, oh, you're great no matter what. Okay, that's, that's, not, that's not really what I'm talking about. But it's this constant belief there's something wrong with us. And I've seen this over the years, and it, it, it burdens me deeply because when we look at the Scripture, we see something quite different. And we're going to get into that. But what, what, what I noticed is that this type of stuff, it doesn't happen without an accusation. It doesn't happen without somebody accusing you. And that's what this message is about. The title, if you will, is The Power of an Accusation. We're going to talk about who accuses us, 
how he accuses us, for what purpose he accuses us, why we're accused. We're going to talk about, briefly, a couple other things relating to that. What happens when we internalize these messages, which is, I think, what I've seen over the years in a lot of Christian people. And what's our response to get out of it, to move on from it. So that's, that's where we're going this morning. We'll be in Job chapter 1 here in just a moment, so if you'd like to go ahead and get going with that, um, turn to that in your Bibles. We'll be there in, in just a few moments. Have you ever noticed lately how difficult it is to turn on the news or maybe log onto the computer or something and not hear about some new accusation or allegation leveled against somebody? Has anybody noticed this? Uh, this just in such and such a so and so has the other way around. It's just been accused of something for the 18th time in three hours, you know. And you go, okay, maybe there's something else on. You know, allegations of embezzlement and whatever misconduct of, of various sorts. And it just seems like our society is kind of obsessed with this. These accusations, these allegations, they are replete in our society. And my opponents notice this or it, it seems like too even more so lately um, with some of the Olympic type trainer stuff that was happening and, and it's, it's just it's just a really big deal. In that case, a lot of those accusations are legitimate. A lot of those allegations are true. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the false kind. Accusations, they are so powerful that simply being accused has the power to disrupt your whole life. There are some things that people are accused of, and they're fired. Well, there's no proof. It doesn't matter. We can't, we, we can't handle the optics of this. We can't handle how this might look, what people might think, all these things. An accusation is so powerful. And with social media these days, I mean, people or here or however you do it, in a matter of moments, someone decides there's something wrong with you, they jump on their social media, if you will, or emails or whatever, and your reputation can be smeared in just a moment. This is the world in which we live. Accusations can totally disrupt you and everything that you are doing. When I was researching this topic, I ran across an article that reads like this. If the accusations are not true, the person is in a situation that is similar to being bullied. Even if one is rich, successful, famous, or has it all, the psychological devastation can be ruinous. It's not just what it does to the things that you do, but who you are. If you are not believed, if you cannot fight back with the true story, if now you are distrusted and under scrutiny, the sense of helplessness is overwhelming. You and I have accused them. When we got ourselves right with God, by responding to the grace that was reaching out to us. When that happened, we became the target. Satan is your accuser. If we will look at Job chapter 1, we will see this a little more clearly. Before we do, in Revelation 12, we see that Satan is the accuser of the brethren. That's you and me as believers. So let's take a quick look at... Job chapter 1, I will be beginning in verse 8. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. Does Job fear God for nothing? Satan replied, Have you not put a hedge around him and his household and everything he has? You have blessed the work of his hands so that his flocks and herds are spread throughout the land. But stretch out your hand and strike everything he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. Then the Lord said to Satan, Very well, everything he has is in your hands, but on the man himself do not lay a finger. Then Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. Think of this. God was speaking well of Job. And Satan said, I know you think that, God, but let me counsel you real quick. <laughs> ah. So that Job only does this because of the great things that you do for him. 
Job is only a Christian because you could put a hedge of protection around his family and you have multiplied the things that he has. That's why he's a Christian. God's going, oh, okay. Right. Satan so says, let me, you know, do these things and then we'll see what happens. And so that's what happened. And we know the end of the story. Those accusations weren't true as we saw. And Job remained in the faith, so to speak, throughout the duration of the book of Job, and he was repaid twice for everything he had. But this word accuse, accuse, you and I have an accuser. This word accuse in the Greek is a word called kategoreo. I probably pronounced that incorrectly. I'm not Greek, you know. Um, that would be nice because I don't always have a tan, but I'm, I'm not Greek. But what, what this word implies is the kind of accusation that a prosecuting attorney would make before a judge. So think of that courtroom show you watch, or used to watch, or maybe you've seen pictures, where somebody is doing everything they can to convince the jury that this man, woman, is guilty. Look at all, I've got these pie charts, and I've got these expert witnesses, and all this stuff. All that's left for them is a jail cell. This person is, this is, this is the kind of accusation that you and I endure all day, every day, by Satan before God. This is what it means to be accused. For what purpose does the enemy labor so vigorously? Okay, I get that it's Satan that accuses us, but what's the point? Like, what, did he not read the end of the book? Right? What, what is the point that he is doing this? And the point that he's doing this is for the purpose of condemnation. You go back to your courtroom show that you watch, used to watch, don't watch pictures you see. And imagine this prosecuting attorney, he does everything, he or she does everything they need to do to convince this jury of the defendant's peers that they are guilty. Again, pie charts. I don't know if they use those in the courtrooms or not, but nevertheless. Imagine juror number one or 12 or whomever stands up and says, uh, yes, judge, we have, um, we find the defendant such and such and so and so uh, guilty. Imagine the judge saying guilty, guilty. Yeah, yeah, you're, you're, you're probably right. I mean, those pie charts were pretty convincing and you're probably right. Well, everybody go home, have a great day, and enjoy the sunshine. Exactly. Thank you, Asher. Imagine the prosecutor be like, all this work, all these expert witnesses, the pie charts. Where's the guilty verdict? That's the point of an accusation, is to bring down a charge, a condemnation, a punishment. So imagine... This prosecutor's confusion when that doesn't happen, that would be like Satan accusing you for nothing. But he accuses you for something, and the something that he accuses you is condemnation. Now hang with me, because this is going to get interesting. Okay, let's take just a moment here. I began the message by telling you about many of the Christians that I've known that they constantly feel bad about themselves. Not because there's something in particular that they need to get handled, but they just feel one down. They just feel less than. They just feel bad at a base level. Satan is our accuser. And his accusations are for the purpose of condemnation. And that is how many of those people feel. They feel condemned. That's where we're headed how does he accuse us? What, what kinds of things would a prosecutor say about the defendant? Well, if we look at Job, we, we get an idea of what Satan does in respect to his accusations. He attacks your character. Has anyone ever felt like their character is under attack? Satan attacks Job's character. One of the things he does is he calls his intentions into question. Well, yes. He's, he's, he's faithful to you now, but the thing is, he's only faithful to you because of what he gets from it. 
Has anyone ever felt this before? Has the enemy ever whispered in your ear, you're only tithing because of God's blessings? Have you ever heard anything like, you're only helping people because it makes you feel good? Maybe something like, you don't really love God's people, you just want to be on board or a Sunday school teacher. This is the way Satan does this. He called Job's intentions into question. He also called Job's devotion and ability to stick with it into question. He's okay now, Satan told God later in the book of Job. But go against his body. Afflict his body. The boils, remember, that he's scraping. Go do that. And then you will see him turn his back on you. His intentions are called into question. His devotion is called into question. His ability to endure, which the Greek word for endure is to remain under a trial test or anything like that, to remain under for the purpose of maturation and all these other things that come that are good that come out of those things. This is what the enemy does. Is any of this resonating? Because this is my story. I know it's many other people's story. He accuses you. He accuses you because he wants you to be condemned. And he does this by attacking your character. The other question that I have, why does he do this? We don't, for the purpose he does, is condemnation, but what's the point of you and I feeling condemned? Why would that be beneficial to the enemy? Because it will render us fruitless and powerless in the kingdom. Have you known somebody who feels bad about themselves all the time? Not something specific that they need to get. I'm talking about somebody. The self-deprecation that says, I am terrible, I am horrible, I am what? How fruitful are they, typically? They don't do a lot because they don't feel like they can do a lot. They don't do it like this. They don't feel like they should do a lot. They feel like frauds when they go to teach Sunday school, when they try to tell their coworker about Jesus. It doesn't. It doesn't go together. Condemnation and fruitfulness do not go together. Satan failed at the cross. He failed. He probably thought he won, but he failed. He probably has read the end of the book. And he knows that his fate is sealed. You and I, deceiving you and me, is his last ditch effort to disrupt the plan of salvation, to disrupt what God is doing, to disrupt your ability to be fruitful in the kingdom. That's, right. That's why he does this. And to be blunt, I'm tired of it. I'm tired of it. I'm tired of that being true for me. I'm tired of that being true for you if it is. I'm, I'm, I'm tired of it. See, everything Satan does is for the purpose of condemnation, but everything God does is about redemption. Amen. It's about reconciliation. It's about redeeming you to him. It's about getting this right. And it's about redeeming you to others and others to you. And it's about getting this right. This is, this is God's plan. You didn't know that you were doing aerobics in the church this morning. I didn't know I was going to do this either. But that's, that's what redemption and, and salvation and reconciliation is all about. And the enemy hates it. See, we read in the scriptures that there's no condemnation for us who are Christians. I'm going to read a couple things real quickly. John 3, 17 and 18. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. Romans 8, 1, perhaps the most famous of all scriptures related to condemnation. There is therefore now no Condemnation for those in Christ. Not, there is therefore now less condemnation for those in Christ. Or only about certain things here and there, if you're not feeling very good that particular. There is no condemnation for those in Christ. 
I hope that you will receive that this morning. But we're, we're, we've still got a little more work to do. I understand your pastor usually preaches about two to three hours. <laughs> so, um, I'm just going to let that hang for a second. <laughs> No, 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 just kidding, just kidding. But hey, if the Spirit has a plan for something like that, I'm down. I'm right. totally down for that. God didn't send Jesus to condemn the world, but to save the world. There is no condemnation for those in Christ. Perhaps the most explicit example of this that we see, especially with this idea of accusations, is in John 8, with the woman caught in adultery. A very well-known scripture the scribes and Pharisees bring this woman caught in adultery before Jesus to test him, to see what he will do. I've, I've heard it said that the Romans would have been peering in on this situation, and the Jews would have been peering in on this situation. And Jesus was kind of in a catch-22 as it relates to the laws referring to the Romans and, and death and condemnation, the sort of things that would have been permitted here by the law. And the Jews wanted to see that happen, and so there were some other things happening in addition to just what this woman was going through. But Jesus, being the master that he is, said, okay, if for those of you who don't know the story, brought a woman, caught adultery before Jesus, said, the law says we can stone her, what do you say? He says, he doesn't say, well, no, the law doesn't say that because the law doesn't say that. He says this, if you are without sin, you cast the stone. What was he saying? Really? Really? What he was saying was, I'm the only one who can condemn her because I'm the only one without sin. Right. Amen. They walked away, one at a time, until it was just Jesus and the woman. She stood up. He said, has no one condemned you? Conde Listen to this language. Another translation, I believe, says, where are your accusers? Okay? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir. No one. Then go now and leave your life of sin. You see, the, the, the salvation, the reconciliation, the redemption happened before her charge to change who she was. She had to experience that first. But there was no condemnation for her as she sought the forgiveness of Jesus, no doubt. See, if the fruit of the Spirit is peace, right. among many other things, it's, it's in part peace. The fear of the enemy is everything contrary to that, and primarily fear. There's nothing peaceful about shame. If you know people who feel humiliated all the time, you know people who feel bad all the time, you know people who are fruitless because they don't feel like they can or should do anything worthwhile for the kingdom, are they at peace? And if they're not, there's something wrong with the fruit of the Spirit? No. See, when we internalize this message of condemnation, when we let it in, when it gets into the depths of our spirit, what happens? We assume the role of the guilty. When we let the accusations and condemnation of the enemy in, we start to think we can't really move on from our past. That's right. Is this the gospel? Hardly. When we let this stuff in, we struggle with feelings of inadequacy, do we not? I mean, is this, am I, it, it, are you just my journal this morning? Or <laughs> We believe we aren't really worthy of love and anything good. Come on, I know that this is not just my story. And I'm tired of it. Like I said before, we will adopt a shame-based identity. Whereby we will believe, we will be absolutely convinced that at the base level there is something wrong with us. That we are inherently flawed. When this stuff gets in, we walk around as though we've been bailed out of jail, but are still awaiting a sentence. See, we know that the Bible says that we have been redeemed and forgiven. I just recounted a couple scriptures to you, three actually, that you probably could have done so as well. You are aware that there is no condemnation in Christ. We know in our heads that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So what is going on? 
Why have we opened ourselves up to this? Well, I would contend that it is maybe not entirely in your control, though it is now our responsibility to work this out. But maybe Satan isn't the only one who's ever accused you. You see, what happened between Satan and God about Job, Job wasn't actually privy to. Maybe Satan isn't the only one who has accused you. Do you have any wounds from people's words? Has anyone ever said, I don't want to poke at him, but to make my point, has anyone ever said something like, you are just hopeless. You are a loser. You can't do anything right. A friend of mine in college, her mom told her that she had a black heart. You see, I wish that old saying were true. If sticks and stones could break my bones, or would break, but words could never hurt me. Don't you wish that was true? But it isn't. It isn't true. See, some of us feel condemned because other people want us to. Right. Other people want us to feel condemned. Now, remember, everything God does is about redemption and reconciliation. Everything the enemy does is about condemnation. Whose side were they on? The people that said these things to you. As a child, as a teen, as an adult. The things that they said... You're a loser. You're of a black heart. All, all these types of things. You're hopeless. Nothing will never amount to anything. Whose side were they on? That's right. That is not the character of God. If you speak to people like this, whose side are you on? That's right. I'm a parent. That's my 10 month old daughter making noise right now. <laughs> this point has become more meaningful to me now than ever, that I would be careful with my words for her sake. That I would never say anything that would look like I'm on the wrong team. The enemy has accused them, and people have joined him in those accusations to tell them things like, you're terrible, you have nothing to offer. And when we internalize that, we feel condemned, and this happens because of these things we mentioned. I think another reason that this could happen is because, has anyone ever bullied you spiritually? <laughs> I've been bullied spiritually, like, what are you talking about? Well. When they would have you put on some kind of legalistic yoke around your neck yeah. that doesn't fit because it's unbiblical and arbitrary, I don't, maybe it has something to do with wearing a purple shirt on Tuesdays. Okay, that's, that's, that's always my example because I, I can't think of anything more ridiculous than to say if you wear a purple shirt on Tuesdays, you're not a Christian. But sometimes this legalism stuff might look a little like that. But when you said, no, I'm not going to wear that, 
I am not going to submit to that. And they start to say, well, then you're not a good Christian. And then they tell other people that. Has that ever gotten in? <clears throat> this is real life. This is Monday through Saturday stuff. And Sunday. This is partly my story. It is partly many of the stories, people that I know. And I'm tired of it. Are you tired of it? So what do we do? You're like, Sean, you better not stop now. Because what do we do? There is a word that makes the gospel happen. And that word is a word that sometimes we take for granted. So I, I Lord, give us fresh ears right now. The word is grace. It's being regarded in a way that you didn't earn. We're saved by grace. We're not saved because we, were, we don't wear purple shirts on Tuesdays. Or anything like that. We have to know grace. But see, the thing is, a lot of us do. We've read the word. We know this thing. So what else is there? How else can we feel, find freedom from the sense of condemnation? Well, that part is essential. We have to know grace. We have to know about it. We have to understand it. But there's something else. We have to experience it. And that might mean some of us need to make some new friends. Because some of the people who would have you feeling condemned and less than, who has essentially locked arms with the enemy and said, I'm going to participate with you in this, they're not the kind of people you want to be around. This message also might find you on the offending end where you might say, Sean, you know what? The Spirit is talking to me because I am that person. I have said things. I don't let people move on from their past. I constantly remind them of all the things they've done wrong. I speak ill of people. I tell people they're not going to make it. If that's you, perhaps a season of repentance is in order. I'm not saying you're not a Christian. I'm not saying that. Maybe you're not. And so that's that's kind of the third thing. But maybe the Spirit is saying, your words are not seasoned with salt and they need to be because people need to be healed from this condemnation. So whether you are the victim or the perpetrator, to use courtroom language again, I want to open the altars and invite you forward to do some work, but the thing is, the work that you may need to do, it might be across pews. It might be with the person sitting next to you. We're going to sing the love of God again. And while we do, would you stand with us, first of all, while we sing? And if the Spirit is talking to you in any direction, if He's saying, I don't want you to feel condemned anymore, come to me and receive the grace that I have for you. If that's for you, I invite you forward. And if the, end, if, if the Spirit is saying, there's some work that I want you to do between you and someone else, be obedient to Him this morning. So would you stand with me as we sing the love of God?
first one to step out. The love of God's storage and pure, how With an uplifted hand, would you would you communicate with me, Sean? Something you said um, it, it it touched me. I I I have this this issue of feeling condemned all the time. And and would you just pray for me? If that's you, would you just slip your hand right up and then right back down? Thank you. Thank you. And if you are far enough along in your journey and you appreciate the grace of God, would you make it a point to show somebody that grace this week? Before they deserve it, and even if they don't, would you just show them God's love this morning and this week? Maybe it is this morning when that will happen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, this is a message, Lord, that I needed a long time ago. And I just want to thank you for the healing that is possible. I want to thank you that you care about us to such a level that you want us to know and experience the freedom that comes by the gospel of Jesus. After all, it does mean good news, and there's nothing good news related about condemnation. And I pray, Lord, that as we interact with our friends and our family and our co-workers, that if there is even an instant when a condemning word will come on our tongue, Lord, that you would help us to take that captive to the obedience of Christ. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to this church this morning, your church. I just pray that your Holy Spirit will saturate us so much Wherever we go from here, people are going to say, Hey, what's, uh, what's going on with you today? They'll say, Hey, it's, it's Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.